Or they may be going to Mars, right? So I hope between now and 20 years we catch up with an asteroid. So uh, tsunami causes huge trouble in Japan. Earthquakes, I live in California, an earthquake every 20 minutes or so. <laughs> Sometimes earthquakes in the developing world are devastating. These are natural disasters. You can prepare for them, but you can't really do anything about them. But there's another natural disaster we could prevent, and that's the early thing to get with an asteroid. Ancient dinosaurs had some trouble with that. And uh, as far as anybody knows, they, they did not do anything about it. <laughs> but we could. And uh, so if you, I don't know how much time to spend with this, but you can't really push an asteroid up or down out of the plane, of the, the main plane, out of the effect, uh, out of the equipment. You have to slow it down or speed it up. And uh, we hope by sending people to an asteroid, we'll just learn more about them. And the OSIRIS-REx mission, we're going to scoop up some asteroid and bring it back and try to learn more about them because <clears throat> it is the disaster that we can prevent and it's worth preventing. And it's also interesting to note for me, when I was young, <laughs> nobody had a good theory about what happened to the ancient dinosaurs. Well, they were stupid. Their brains were small. <laughs> and so they were, so rats out-competed them. <laughs> Rob, what? Yes, mice. Mice were smarter than dinosaurs. Really? But now, of course, for everybody who loves the asteroid theory, it's pretty good. That, uh, that's why that's what we took out the ancient dinosaurs. We don't want that to happen to us. So I hope we catch up with an asteroid in the next 20 years, and I hope we'll say, can I say in the next 30 years, we send people to Mars. And if there was somebody with grandkids, over there, they will be the astronauts. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, here it is, yes. A little bit red.
you know, I should go to a tweet up for here. Wait! Here we are! This is the coolest thing. Right? Uh, the coolest thing for me is what exactly what we're doing today is exploring and venturing out. You know, I, I don't know if it was Carl Sagan that said that not only are we un, are we insignificant in the cosmos, we are undetectable. And um, when you think about the vastness of our our, our solar system, our universe, uh, and you look back on this little blue ball of life here, you know, it may really it's an awe-inspiring uh, task to really venture out to somewhere new. So that's the most exciting thing for me is we're just this little ball here, and uh, and uh, we are one of the universe's ways of knowing itself. <laughs> And as I always say, you know, if we stop exploring, if instead of doing this today, you're doing something else, what does that say about you? You stop looking out, you stop trying to find out what's going on beyond the horizon. Because you said, I mean, it says you don't care, you want to stay home. Yeah, heck with that. That's not good. So how about another one? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> so when you get a notice that something is headed, I think this more big. Astro. Astro wheels, yes. <laughs> when you notice that something's coming toward the ISS, you better notice how much time do you need before you can't do anything and you have to get into soybeans? <laughs> okay. Um, we actually have, we have really great rocket scientists uh, and orbital mechanics uh, folks here on the Earth that uh, track these things that are inbound, or maybe it's, it's, it might be a piece of space junk or something inbound. That they they know the trajectory, so we have a red, yellow, red, yellow, and green uh, conjunction scenario. So they'll give usually give us a warning about 24 hours out. It's like, hey, tomorrow this time. Right now we're green, but we're expecting to switch to yellow. And what's the thing that would become a George? A piece of paint. Uh, piece an of old wrench. An old <laughs> wrench. <laughs> Maybe somebody had to drop a satellite, pieces of satellites and, and uh, rocket parts and things. And so uh, we do have conjunctions that turn into red, and then we have to sequester into our Soyuz because that's our lifeboat on board. And in the six months I was there, we did that twice. We had a, wow. we had a conjunction that was going to come pretty close. But in, you know, when you're traveling at five miles per second, which these other parts are traveling as well, if it comes within just a, a few uh, dozen kilometers. That's a red, you know. So, so uh, it's uh, it's not a good day if it impacts you. Of course, we can we can change the attitude of the station. We can change the we can raise the orbit. We can change the attitude and maybe put a, a smaller profile toward that object. And we can sequester into the uh, Soyuz as well. So, so it's uh, and so you, you you kind of then you're kind of open for the big sky little bullet kind of th theory, you know. Where you get real small and you're so used, and so if it impacted the station for whatever reason, you could depart and come home. So. Uh, I guess guy in black, SBAC to space. Yeah. Uh, like if you're, uh, I forgot my question. Uh, um, yeah, if you're on the space station and like this. Instead of something dangerous, something very cool is flying by. We could take the Soyuz and go for a spin and go in the <laughs> like, like the shuttlecraft on Star Trek. You probably could, but uh, you'd be in trouble when you got home, probably. But, uh, we actually did a, we actually repositioned our Soyuz, which is kind of a neat thing. We, we got there in a, uh, just a couple weeks after we docked. We actually had a repositioning to a, reposition to another docking port, and that was actually kind of cool. We Why did you have to do that? Uh, to make way for uh, the next uh, progress vehicle, resupply vehicle that was coming. And uh, the, the Russians now have two dock, docking ports, the mean one and two, that now are fully functional docking ports. And at the time we arrived, it wasn't fully outfitted, uh, the one where we were supposed to dock to. So we arrived, we, we fixed it up, we, uh, we got it all uh, arranged so we could dock at that port now. And then we undocked, flew around the station and redocked. We were only undocked for about 40 minutes or so. But it's a lot of fun, you know, actually going out for a little little drive around the day. And nobody said to you, I'm sorry, Doug. I can't let you back in here. Okay. <laughs> it gets all to be hell for some reason. 
guy in red. Doug, you got an astronaut taken from an astronaut. <coughs> what are the projects we're working on? Go close to your mouth. Uh, what, are the, what are the programs, the projects we're working on now that we're currently um, overcome the obstacles we have with getting men to Mars? Well, here's what I want, people. <laughs> Speaking of how, uh, we need uh, lighter and stronger materials, almost certainly derivative carbon nanotubes. And I want somebody at some space agency, someplace, to make a, rock, a uh, spaceship that spins, for crying out loud. <laughs> it's not clear. How long were you in space? A hundred and some days. Yeah, six months. And you had to work out constantly, right? Yes. And it's hot and sweaty. It's hot and sweaty. Because the, the, no, there's no convection. That's right. They don't have any or not any serviceable gravity up there. That's exactly right. What Bill will say with the um, one of the things we're trying to do with these long duration stays on the space station, we're actually trying, we're actually replicating with the human body as well and our life support systems a trip to Mars. And so we stay now. Technically, we should stay there for eight to nine months, whatever it would take for us to get up there in a chemical rocket get to Mars. But uh, but we replicate this as an analog to traveling to Mars. And so the things that happen to you physiologically are, the, are some of the major things that we're studying for sending humans to Mars. So when we get back, things are a little strange. You know, your balance system is a little... How long did it take you to get your <laughs> Earth? There, there are actually, I still have symptoms a year later of, uh, of things that are with my readjustment to gravity. And the most powerful one for me is my vision. What I didn't realize, and one of the things we started realizing just in the last couple of years, we have exercise countermeasures on board the space station. So we have a cycle ergometer that we can change the wattage and the resistance. We have a weight machine that looks like a universal gym that's isolated from the side of the space station. And uh, we also have a treadmill that we pull down the bungees. And, and while we're doing this, when you get to space within the first just few weeks, your body starts to figure out that you really don't need your legs anymore. And so it starts pumping a lot of fluid to your upper extremities, including your, your inner cranial pressure begins to increase. And as you, as you are there for a couple of weeks, you diurese a lot of that. So, so you actually diurese. You pee it. Oh. <laughs> Tweet that. <laughs> So you pee this off, and so you're, you're actually in a state in space, you're actually at the proper hydration, but if you were to come back to Earth, you're in a dehydrated state. So anyway, we're, when we get on this treadmill or on this weight machine, we're actually trying to kind of condition our muscles and our skeletal structure, and we actually actually fool the brain a little bit to think. So, so the brain is like, okay, are we back in gravity? What are we doing here? And so it continues to pump this pressure to your to your head. And so I came back with, and this pressure inside your intracranial pressure actually pushes on the back of your eyes and actually flattens your retina. So it, it's like a diopter shift, like a diopter shift in your vision. You probably have read about this. It's a it's sort of a new finding. And I was like number one in the shoot. I came out of that studio and was like, hey, I can't see very well. Everything was. It's like taking the focus ring and just kind of a little bit out of focus. And that's still coming back, so even after a year. And so there are lingering effects. From, and these are things that we really need to solve. You know, if we're going to go on to Mars and we're going we're gonna to send somebody to Mars, they're going to be on the planet away from here for maybe three years. You know, transit there, space, a space lab there and then back. And uh, if we can't solve these things now, we're, we're in a hurt, world hurt. So that's one of the major things we're doing on the station now. I want something that spins. It doesn't have to be one G. We'll and find out how much it makes. And this would help with that. It really would help with that. <laughs> Not me going like this. <laughs> Not your finger. Yeah. Hey, Doug, this question is for you. As, as an astronaut, do you have a feel for uh, how many astronauts out there would be willing to do a one-way mission to Mars? Is that something that is would a lot of people sign up for? <laughs> You know, I, I've actually never been asked that question, but I ask that question to kids a lot, you know, because you, you have these people, especially these young scientists and young uh, uh, kids that want to be astronauts, I said, okay, would you, who in this room would go to Mars? Okay, let's take a show of hands. If, if this rocket were going to Mars and say, we're going to put a person on this, who in this room would go? Okay? Now, now this doesn't have the equipment to bring you back safely. Now, who would, 
Sure. Oh, no, and you'd say that. Okay. Well, yeah, they say that. <laughs> but, are there any pilots here? Yeah. How many of you take off not intending to work? <laughs> So, uh, so, you know, it's not like, okay, let me put it this way. How many people can't wait to go live in Antarctica the rest of their lives? Cool. No, there's very few people. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cold, it's dry, and it's dark. But, and, you know, if you go to Mars, I've not I've been there, but uh, it's very hard to breathe. So they don't have anything for us to breathe, and you would you would notice that right away. <laughs> Your eye would go right to it. So that, that's a very good question. It's one of the psychological things you have to. Do. On top of that, even if you had a, a, a sort of a promised return, you're going to be gone away from this planet for three years as well, which is still got some psychological effects on this. Thing. So, so these. What is the most serious emotional effect? A, C, a significant emotional significant event. Emotional event. Yeah. 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 You can't get back. Wow, that, I, you know, Houston, that's a serious that's a, that's a emotional event. <laughs> All right, well, that's cool. Here are waving people. More than things. Space, considering we have more than one tweeting astronaut on the space station sometimes. Uh, I was gonna, I was actually gonna, if Charlie Bullock's still here, I was gonna ask him if he sent me back to the station, I'll do the tweet. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, will you guys show, hey, I got one too, and you're on the space station. <laughs> hey, let's go tweet. <laughs> uh, yes, that would be, uh, yes, let's see, it's $200,000 a ride right now to not get on orbit. So, maybe in 20 years there'll be enough uh, space tourism. If you ask about 20 years, I think it's a little more than that. But the longest journey starts with a single step. So we'll see, it'll be a while. But uh, spiritually, it'll be very soon, or curiosity will be, it'll be very soon. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to know how much radiation do you get on the, uh, on the space station versus when you'll get, when we get going here on Mars? Well, Bill will be able to answer, but here at Mars, we, you, you get, um, uh, we still are within the, in lower orbit where the space station is, we're still pretty well inside the Van Allen belt, protective belts of the Earth. So we do get an increased dose of radiation, and I, I've been told it's similar to uh, someone that works in a nuclear uh, facility, uh, sort of that type of. Now, there is a, a, a higher dose when you're outside on the spacewalk as well because you don't have some of that protection. But you leave these protective belts around the Earth, and it's a different story. So, Bill, can you address that? Well, just that was one of the big things with the living interplanetary flight experiment, which is stuck in our door. It was everybody's pretty sure these microbes will have no trouble with uh, the cold and very little trouble with zero gravity. But the radiation is the big question. So it's hundreds, thousands of times the radiation you get in your lifetime over three years. And uh, everybody wondered what would happen. I mean, you could, people speculate on building uh, spacecraft that are surrounded by a big jacket of water, which is uh, very well suited to soaking up radiation using conventional lead or, or steel shielding or concrete shielding is probably not the best thing for a spaceship because they're heavy. Uh, and it could be that uh, there's people that speculate on their drugs that you may be able to take that would wash the uh, damaged cells out of your body, but we'll see. That's why we want to run these kooky tests with these microbes. So if anybody knows how to get hold of the Phobos grunt mission, it's only overhead for about seven minutes at a time. Uh, let us know. That's a great question. It's, it's unknown. It's unknown. Man in hat. Man in hat. <laughs> okay, as far as going up to orbit, Soyuz and Space Shuttle. Love, hate. Uh, 
Okay. Which one do you want? Soyuz or space shuttle? Okay. All right. Remember, so. you're on camera all the time. <laughs> okay, I promise you guys won't tweet this, okay? Oh, yeah, they promise. Oh, I did it by accident. Okay. Well, I had the, back in 2007, I launched on the space shuttle Discovery, actually, from out here uh, at the, and, um, and then last year I launched on a Russian rocket, a Soyuz. And they're very different. And um, the sets are very different. They're different. Very different. Very different. Now, the, the shuttle, in, um, especially in the first stage, because those boosters are solid fuel, and solid uh, rocket fuel burns much differently than liquid fuel. And the Soyuz rocket is kerosene, so it's a liquid, it's a liquid fuel, so it absorbs a lot of the vibration. In first stage on the space shuttle, I was alarmed at the, vi <laughs> the vibration in the first stage. It's amazing that when it that pounding of your chest is exactly what it's doing to you on board as well. And in first stage, we all wear these you know fancy knee boards and everything, like we're going to race something, you know. And your your pants kind of like this, and, and uh, just really really shaking and very violent. The other the other thing that I noticed on the space shuttles. You know, the, the axis of rotation, you know, the first, within the first eight or nine seconds when the space shuttle comes off the pad, it le leans on its back. It does a roll program, it's called. And it actually, for two reasons, we have communication antennas on the top of the shuttle, so we kind of roll on its back so we can communicate with ground sites up the east coast and Bermuda and all the way into orbit. And, and so we do a roll, roll the heads up and then we can talk through the satellites. But we also create a negative angle of attack because the shuttle it is a, a, like a cinder block with little stubby wings. It still has wings, and it wants to, when there's air flowing over it, it wants to uh, fly off the, uh, off the stack, and so it creates a negative angle attack and it kind of holds it against the stack as well. Well, when that roll on TV, or we look at out here, it looks like a nice smooth roll, but you're actually sitting about 20 to 25 feet uh, moment arm from where that roll axis is, and so when that roll program kicks in, you can feel the engines Gimbal, and then you swing around like the, on the end of a merry-go-round. And so that ride to orbit is pretty rough. Now in the Soyuz, it's very, very smooth. You see these guys on TV, and they're, they're in there, you know, exchanging recipes or whatever, you know. And uh, it's very, very calm. Now, coming home, it's the other way around. Coming home in the shuttle, very smooth, a little bit of lateral vibration. And, uh, but other than that, it was really, really smooth coming back. The Soyuz, it's like riding in a barrel over Niagara Falls that's been set on fire. <laughs> Service Mission Specialist operating a robotic arm on two space shuttle missions for the International Space Station. 